But talk about the Higgs particle. Uh, it was predicted uh, a number of years ago, uh, and that was the big excitement over the summer. And then pretty much where particle physics is going. Uh, there's a fair number of other uh, 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 slides I have here. So how much future particle physics we'll get to, I, I don't know. But we'll, there's a natural term termination point of risk comes to us. So first of all, it is CERN. Uh, CERN stands for the European Center for Nuclear Research. Uh, it is located, these blue countries here are the European countries that belong to it. It's a consortium. They realize that these particle accelerators are, are billions of dollars. There's no way that one country, unless you're large like the United States, and even here we're having trouble with it and fund it. So they formed a consortium in the 50s to basically uh, start uh, building accelerators to uh, analyze uh, particle physics. And it's located right here, right at the boundary between France and uh, Switzerland. And if you're wondering why it's not E, C, and R, well, it's here in, in, in France, and so you put the adjectives after the, the, the nouns. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was crazy, crazy thinking. Okay. Uh, this is the top view we had again. Uh, if you're flying above uh, this region here, you would not see this. First of all, uh, sometimes they'll do things differently in Europe, but they certainly don't paint dotted lines between the borders of countries. Okay. <laughs> so I think we can be assured of that. That dotted line here represents the border between uh, Switzerland and France. So over here, it's Switzerland. Okay. Over here is French. It's pretty obvious if you look at it. That's a joke. Okay. Uh, the particle accelerator itself is huge. It's this big. Uh, there's one oval here. And if you look over here, there's another oval here. You don't see these from the sky as well. These are, these are deep underground to shield them from cosmic rays. But um, somebody went through and actually put a little uh, line around here. So we can actually see. If you look at the actual diameter in this thing, it's 8.6 kilometers, so basically 9 kilometers and close to 5 miles. If you want then the, the, the circumference around it, multiply it by pi, which is basically 3, and the limit that pi equals 3. Okay? So you're basically getting you know, 15, 15 miles around, something like that, 24 kilometers, something like that. Uh, this big ring that you're seeing here is called the Large Hadron Collider, or the LHC. Uh, I haven't defined what the word uh, hadron is. I'll explain that in a little bit. Uh, later on what, what the word hadron is. But this is a particle accelerator where the uh, Higgs was discovered. This is a picture of the people involved in, in the process. Uh, this is actually the uh, this is actual a picture of the detector. Uh, it's scale. So you can see how large the uh, person is compared to the detector. The detector is absolutely enormous. And literally, uh, when they write a paper, when they write a paper, all these people here will have their name on the paper. So when you actually look at the paper, the first two or three pages of this paper are nothing but basically somebody's name and where they're from. So it's really good to have a name like, you know, uh, Adam Arno or something like that. So it's, you're, you're guaranteed to have your, your name referenced quite a bit. Uh, but before we get here, okay, so before you can really appreciate this picture, you have to appreciate a different picture. You have to appreciate this picture. Uh, for those of you in physics, you recognize this, except you don't recognize it in color. Uh, actually, a student just sent to me the, uh, this picture about a week ago. This is from the 1927 Solvig uh, Conference. Uh, you could actually just give a mini talk just on this picture itself. Pretty much, you pick a random person here, and it's somebody extremely famous, uh, without which you wouldn't have a lot of the, the science that we have today. Uh, Here's Einstein. Uh, in 1927, Einstein's reputation wasn't what it was. He didn't really adopt a lot of the modern ideas of quantum mechanics. So although he's certainly prevalent there, um, his reputation isn't quite what it was back when he did general relativity. There's uh, Marie Curie. Uh, there's uh, there's you know, Thor. Okay. But who are we going to look at here? Okay. <coughs> We're going to start with this fellow back here, Erwin Schrodinger. And he's really the one who started doing quantum mechanics, how it's done today. So I want to talk a little bit about what he did. Uh, Wolfgang Pauli is the next fellow. Unfortunately, this is coming toward the end of the talk, and I think Wolfgang is going to be uh, cut short. Sorry, Wolfgang. Okay. He was really kind of a nasty guy anyways. He was, he was uh, certainly the curmudgeon of the group. Uh, he it was so bad as actually doing the Manhattan Project when basically everyone in the United States was working on the Manhattan Project. No one asked him to join. And there, <laughs> <laughs> there was, th they, they basically, okay, the, the main reason was no one could really work with him. He was, he was an extremely difficult person to work with. The phrase, not even wrong, that, that comes from him. Okay. Uh, but they basically, to make him feel better, they said, look, somebody has to stay outside of this project and kind of keep up with what's going on in physics and you know, keep everyone honest. Okay. So he was involved in the project. 
And then uh, there's an enigma here, uh, Paul Dirac. Uh, he's a lot of the modern stuff we have today is entirely due to him. It's one of those names that no one really hears about, and uh, you could be in a room just with him, and you wouldn't know he was there. He, was, he had the reputation for being silent. He was certainly an enigma. So the actual talk, what we're going to do is the following. Well, first of all, I want to talk about what quantum mechanics is, and I hopefully will, you will not leave thinking, you know, quantum mechanics means a particle behaves like a wave. It doesn't. Uh, I've never done this before. I'm going to actually try to give you qualitatively how this thing goes correctly. I'm going to try not to cut a lot of corners and actually do it um, correctly. We'll, we'll see how well it works. Okay. So once you understand quantum mechanics, we're going to do a, we're going to require some ver odd variation in it, uh, which seems odd. But if you do that, you automatically get basically modern particle physics. So I want to explain what modern particle physics is, and if you take all the phys uh, physics, particle physics theories through various branches, you put them all together and you get the best theory ever, and it has to be true because it's in capital letters, and it can't be in capital letters if it wasn't true, okay? <coughs> and that's called the standard model. Um, however, to get the standard model to work, okay, you need something called Higgs. And I want to explain what the Higgs is and why we need it. And then our best theory ever that can never be uh, beaten by anything, well, it turns out it's probably wrong, okay? And uh, there's a there's reasons why it's probably wrong. And then I want to talk about solutions for it. Uh, I, there's a whole bunch of possible solutions for this. The one I'm going to concentrate on is supersymmetry, assuming I get to it. The reason why is that supersymmetry, might, a lot of these ideas might be actually confirmed at CERN in the next uh, few years or so. So supersymmetry might be something you hear about in the news not, not to, in, in the you know, couple years from now. So let's start off with Schrodinger. So I'm teaching a course in quantum mechanics this semester, and uh, the way I teach it is I teach the various postulates of quantum mechanics. And a postulate, as you might remember from taking geometry, you can't use a theory to prove a postulate. It's really a starting point. So I'm going to give you a postulate. I can't prove this postulate, and that's okay. Absolutely no one can. All I can do is say that this postulate is consistent with experiment. Okay. So what does that mean? Okay, we're going to take a system. A system is anything you want to study. Okay, so it could be that this room is our system. And it could be that, you know, this little green laser. Okay, and th this shows just how professional I am, green laser. Do the other people have green lasers when they talk? No, they have red. Okay, so <coughs> <coughs> that's good to know. Uh, okay, so uh, where were we going with this? So as anything you're studying, that's your, that's your system. And the claim is, is that there exists some function. You, you use a Greek symbol psi for it. Uh, you don't use psi because it's a pitchfork, so it's straight from hell. You use it just because that's what Schrodinger did. Okay? So you call that the wave function, or, or psi. And the claim is, is that if you know psi for your system, anything you can ever possibly know about your system is contained in that function. Okay? So that means, in principle, if I want to know anything I can possibly know about this room, okay, anything, all I have to do is calculate the psi for this room, and then I know anything I can ever possibly know about this room. That's the claim. Okay? Well, with that said, it's really nice to take an example. And so when you're taking learning quantum mechanics, we're going to start off with the simplest example we, we uh, can do. <coughs> we're going to take an atom, and for our sake, just imagine it's just a tiny ball. Okay? And we're going to put it in a narrow cylinder. Okay? So what does that look like? There's a ball, okay? very round, very ball-like. Okay? And here's our, here's our cylinder. So imagine, you know, here's my cylinder. So imagine, uh, and it's narrow. So imagine here would be my cylinder, okay? It's very narrow, and I'm going to take a little atom, and I'm going to take this little atom, and I'm going to put it inside here, and I'm going to let this little atom move back and forth, okay? That's going to be my simplest system, okay? And what we're going to ask is, okay, well, there should be a wave function for that system. What would it look like? Okay. So it turns out that Schrodinger had a method for calculating. It doesn't matter what the method is. Uh, there's a prescription, you do it, and if you turn some mathematical uh, cranks, you can actually calculate psi. Turns out that psi for this looks a lot like waves on a rope. Okay? So here's your original problem. I'm going to call the distance from this left end to the particle, I'm going to call that x. So here's my x-axis here, that's my x-axis. And it turns out that if I draw my wave function for this, so if I calculate it, you get this thing that looks like a wave here, like on a rope. Okay, it's not a wave on a rope, it just looks like a wave on a rope. So this axis here is psi, so this would be a positive contribution up here, this would be a negative contribution down here. And there, 
the claim is, is that this is everything we need to know about that particle. And you look at that and say, good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we've put this particle in this box and now we've set it to this. And we now know everything about it. That's, that's lucky. Okay. Well, what can you do with this? Well, it turns out there's another corollary to his postulate. Okay. It turns out that psi by itself doesn't have any physical meaning, but if you square it, you get a lot of meaning out of it. Okay. So what I did down here, here's the original picture. Okay. The blue line here, like this, this is the original uh, side, the wave function. There it is. And we're going to square it. So this black curve up here is psi squared. So remember from math that if you take a negative number and square it, it becomes positive. So this negative part up here, if you square it, it basically flips up here. And so it's this curvy thing that looks like that. Okay? If you saw this, then basically lot Ness, you would claim that you're saying Nessie. Okay? It's probably a better estimation for Nessie than Nessie. Okay? Uh, and the claim is, is that if you square a psi, what this is, this is the likelihood for finding a particle. So what does this mean? So that black curve there is going to be the likelihood of finding a particle. That means where this is zero, so it's zero here at this left end. You never find that particle at that left end. Okay, if you look over here at this right end, it's zero there as well. You can't find the particle here. But then something else bizarre happens here. You say, well, suppose I want the particle right here. Can the particle ever be here? According to quantum mechanics, it can't. That's odd. So you know, classically, if you take a little uh, uh, you know, wire and put a particle there and let it go back and forth, it could be anywhere you want inside here. Quantum mechanics says, no, it can't be here. It can't be there. You're more likely to find it here, here, and here. Okay? Turns out there's other wave functions, but they all basically wiggle like that. Okay, so that's what a wave function would look like here. Fine. Now, this, this idea that you have to square this to get, your prob to get this uh, likelihood of finding a particle, that really intrigues physicists. And what a physicist does is says, well, Suppose I take then my wave function that I have, and I'm going to multiply this by minus 1. Okay? So the blue curve over here, this is my original function. That's my original function. So that's my original psi. And if I take that original blue curve and multiply it by minus psi, basically all the positive things become negative, so they flip down, and all the negative things become positive. So that red curve, that's my negative wave function. All I did is multiply by minus sign. And now I could ask those, how do things change? Well, again, life isn't sensitive to psi. Really what it is, it's sensitive to psi squared. So if you square this in each case, right, if you multiply something by minus 1, if you square minus 1, you get a positive. So you get the exact same curve. So you could say, well, the blue curve here gives you this result, but that red curve gives you the exact same result. And again, you can look at this and say, oh, that's, that's fine. Actually, it turns out it is. It's when we tinker with this, it's going to be the basis for particle physics. Okay. So what are we doing here? We're taking this original function here, and we multiplied the entire wave function here by a minus sign. We got some psi squared. When you change the entire wave function by a minus sign, you call that a global change. Now, this is what you're going to do. Physicists started asking the following. Well, whatever the sign is of psi, can you tinker with it at different locations? Okay, so what does that mean? So can I come over here in this part of psi? Can I change the sign of it here? And then maybe if I come over here at this spot, over in this spot here, can I change the sign of that part here? And maybe over here, can I change this spot? So instead of changing the whole thing, all one, multiplying this whole thing by a minus sign, every little different part on this wave function here, or the psi, I'm going to change differently. Okay? The question is, can you do it? Okay, and when you do make these changes everywhere, you call this a local change. Okay? And so this is what we're going to insist. We're going to insist that basically that the equations of quantum mechanics, whatever they are, and there's a way of getting them, that if you make this little uh, change in psi at different locations, that the equations have to remain the same. Okay? So this is kind of a diagram of what we're doing here. Okay? So we're going to take our wave function that contains all the information we can ever possibly know, we're going to change the sign of it at different little spots along here. Okay. We're, going to f we're going to say the qu equations of quantum mechanics, whatever they are, have to remain the same. The question is, what happens? And actually, something incredible happens here. If you do that, you basically predict the quantum theory of electricity and mag magnetism. Okay. So if you had no idea about that there was even something called electricity and magnetism, 
if you basically insisted that you could vary the wave function at the psi at any different point, that the equations must be the same, the prediction is is you get basically uh, the quantum theory of electro uh, electricity magnetism. We call this short um, QED for quantum electrodynamics. Okay. And this is really the birthplace of uh, particle physics, the simple thing. And what you can do, you can actually apply this to, uh, this is actually the most accurate theory in science. I didn't say it's the most accurate theory in chemistry, or the most accurate theory in physics, or the most accurate theory in, in biology. It's the most accurate theory in science. Okay. You can calculate things out to nine, ten decimal places. You can do the experiments, and it works absolutely perfect. It's actually in many ca cases considered a, a, a perfect theory in some, some sense. Okay. So here we have this great theory of particle physics. The question is, what does this thing even look like? Well, the claim is, it's going to look a lot like that. Okay. Okay. So the Q goes to here. And that looks like an E. And that looks like a D. Q, E, D. No, I'm joking. Okay. Uh, so what is this? This is basically two kids. You put two kids on skateboards. And you give one of them a basketball. And you have them toss the basketball back and forth. Okay. That's going to be the modern view of particle physics. And let's see what this means. So we take two electrons, right here, right here. And let's pretend that the electrons are two kids on skateboards. So here's this uh, electron, and here's this electron. And what would happen? Let's let this electron move toward this one, and this electron move toward that one. So those are moving toward each other. When you actually work out the predictions of that theory, what it states is that one of these, it doesn't matter which one, okay? One of these particles, electrons, is actually going to uh, transmit a, a particle to the other one. This particle, in this case, happens to be something called photon, which is, m makes up light. What happens is that it changes here. Okay, so if you go back here, this would be the same thing as this kid here taking his basketball and tossing it to his friend over here. Okay. And what do these two little particles do? Then they scatter off like that. So basically what it's saying is you have a negative charge here and a negative charge here. The reason negative charges repel or light charges repel is that these two charges are actually exchanging particles back and forth. When this one sends out the particle, what does it do? It recoils a little bit. When this one catches that particle, it recoils this way. This one then tosses that particle back, it recoils a little bit further. This one catches it, moves that way a little bit. Um, you could say, well, wait, I know if I have a positive charge and a negative charge, they attract. So that picture doesn't work. It does. Imagine this kid has really long arms, so it reaches over and snatches that basketball away. So if this kid had long arms and reached over and snatched that away, what would happen? This kid would move a little bit closer. And that one says, I want that back, and then snatch it back. And if they keep on snatching it back and forth, it would come together like this. Okay? So what you end up having here is that basically you can describe forces basically in terms of particle exchange. And it's all from that dumb little thing of saying that this wa wave function psi, whatever it is, that we can vary at any spot, and the equations have to remain the same. Okay? So what we're going to do, we're going to take this idea extend it to other systems, and really that's what the standard model is of particle physics. It's nothing but that idea extended to other systems. Now, mathematically, it gets more convol convoluted. Okay. So let's ask, what does a uh, standard model look like of particle physics? Okay. So if I were to ask you, what are the three, what are the four forces that exist naturally in physics? You would say, well, electricity and magnetism, that if I have an electric charge here, that there's some electric field and it puts forces on other charges, fine. But then there's three other forces that uh, uh, exist. Start at the bottom here. Gravity, sure, that's fine. Uh, it turns out that gravity is really the, uh, th that's the first class pair. Uh, no one knows really what to do with that. There's another force called the strong force, and another force called the weak force. Uh, what I do, I'm going to talk about what each of these are. I could do gravity as well. Gra gravity. Okay. That's, it's good to have demonstrations when you have class. Okay, so. <coughs> so, what is the strong force? Okay, so let's say, you know that from uh, um, high school, that if you have some nucleus, what's in the nucleus? Well, so this blue thing represents your little nucleus. And the pink things are your protons, and the brown things are your neutrons. Uh, and the great question of basically the color of protons and neutrons is either pink or brown or, uh, or red and green. It's answered here. It turns out to be pink and brown. Okay. Uh, we're learning a lot here. Some of it's even correct. Okay. So what, what, should, what, what should happen here? Well, from our theory of QED, if you have two light charges, two protons, they should actually start pulling apart. And so what happens is that there should be a very large repulsive force between this proton and this proton because they're right on top of each other in the nucleus. 
and that should just rip this apart. This would mean that there should, the, the, the whole idea of having a nucleus, sh a nucleus shouldn't even exist. Well, they do exist. So there's only one conclusion you can come from that, is that there has to be some other force interacting here. Okay. And that force that basically says that if you have a proton and a neutron, if they get really, really close together, they can become sticky. There's actually a very strong force sticking together. That's your strong force. Okay. You can be a little more fussy with it. Here's our proton, and let's actually look at a larger version of it. Well, it turns out if you look inside your proton, a proton is actually made up of other objects, and you call these other objects quarks. Okay. So one of these objects here is, okay, this is the bad thing about, in particle physics, all the names are dumb. So when I give you a dumb name here, I'm not making up the dumb name. They were given dumb names long before I gave them dumb names. Okay. And so the profound thing here is called an up quark. Fine. Okay. I made it blue for a reason. Okay. Then I'm going to have a down quark. So if you have an up quark, you might as well have a down quark. Okay. <coughs> so here's your down quark. I made that one green. And then here's another up quark, and I made this one red. Okay. Now the reason why, and so what the claim is, is that this whole thing here, this whole combination here, that's actually our, our proton. So if you could somehow get a magnifying glass, a really powerful one, they sell them at Walmart. Okay, they're in the back. And look inside here, what, what your little proton is made up of is actually three little quarks. Okay. Now the reason why they're given uh, different colors is with electric charge, there's positive charge and then there's negative charge. Okay. It turns out that when you go to the strong force, there's more than just two types of charge. There's actually three types. So you call this strong charge. And again, remember, all the names in particle physics are dumb. So this strong charge is called color. So when you say that this is a blue quark, you're really referring to its strong charge. When you say this is a green quark, you're referring to its strong charge. You say this is a red quark, it's a strong charge. So a proton here is basically all the quarks have different colors, okay? and it's really the charge. And that there's two up quarks and a down quark. Okay? A neutron, on the other hand, would actually be basically two down quarks and an up quark. And quarks have actually kind of an odd property. They're the, no, let's go on and then I can show you a little bit more. <coughs> so here's our picture of QED. We have two electrons. Remember, this is for electricity magnetism. We have two electrons. They exchange photons back and forth, and that's the force. Well, if you do the exact same process, you go back to our, our picture of the quarks, and you basically say the wave function for that, if you scramble it in a slightly more com com convoluted way with the color, and say everything has to remain the same, you end up with an identical picture. But what happens here is that your quarks here, the quarks here, instead of being, well, instead of being electrons, you have quarks. And instead of changing a photon, you, explain something, you exchange something called a gluon. And what this does, when you work this out, the gluon acts out like a spring. So if you have two quarks really close together, there's almost no force there. But if you grab one quark and try to pull it out, that force becomes, it's just like a spring. It becomes absolutely enormous. And that actually comes straight out of this theory. So. Again, when you take that wave function and say, I'm going to let the sign vary everywhere and the equations have to remain the same, and you do that for quarks, that pops right out. Okay. That's an absolutely amazing result. Okay. Now, this theory here, okay. this theory is called QCD for quantum chromodynamics. The chromo refers to the fact that it's color. It's a really dumb name. Okay. There's, again, you hear chromo and you think color, and it's not, it's not color. The, the for, of, the, of all the three forces, the one I, I kind of like the best because it's a very odd force, and it's the weak force. And it's the one that most people have uh, very little uh, experience with. And it's really kind of a neat thing. Okay. So this is responsible for certain types of radioactive decay. I'm not going to show you the radioactive decay it's known for because there's something odd you have to do, and I don't want to explain it in a, a, a group like this. Okay. So we're going to do a different reaction. I'm going to take a proton, and I'm going to get an electron really, really close to it. Say it turns out if you take a proton and get an electron really, really close to it, it goes to a neutron and a neutrino. Okay? This is really important in astrophysics. In astrophysics, what happens, you get some of these stars that are basically, you know, they're, they have supernova. The entire core is basically is iron and nickel. The whole star is collapsing. What happens is, is basically the protons of the nucleus, the, el the electrons in the star are forced into the proton. They become neutrons, and then there's neutrinos. And that's actually how you end up getting a neutron star, is that when you have these massive stars collapsing like this, the electrons are forced into the pro protons, you get neutrons. Okay? It turns out the neutrinos are actually a big part of why the actual explosion occurs too, but this reaction is really important. 
So from a particle point of view, what happens? Okay, so here's our little proton. Okay. Uh, here's our little up quark, up quark, and down quark. And let's just say we're watching it one day. So here's a, a proton we meet in the street. Okay. So what happens to our little uh, our proton in the street? Well, this up quark just minds its own business and meanders up here. It's kind of boring. Okay. <coughs> this little down quark just meanders along its way. Doo -doo -doo, no, nothing else. It goes there. Now let's watch the up quark. This up quark here would kind of come along here, minding its own business, but it's accosted by this little electron over here. So this electron comes over here. And what happens here when you actually put in the weak interaction, okay, the particle it exchanges, remember we had for the electromagnetic forces, we had the photons. For the strong, we had the gluon. For the weak interactions, we have this particle called a W. And a W has a very odd effect when you work it out. It actually is going to take this little electron and convert it into a particle called a neutrino. Okay? There's only one neutrino joke. Okay? What's a neutrino? And I tell you a neutron. Okay, so, uh, I told you there's only one. Okay, so, uh, sorry. so what these are, these are basically a massless particle, although it turns out they have some mass. Okay? Uh, they interact very weakly with matter. So right now, uh, the Earth is being bombarded by a huge number of neutrinos. So right now there's some preposterous number of neutrinos going through our body and through the Earth. They barely interact with anything. Okay, so it becomes basically a neutrino. And what happens is uh, that this little up quark, when it spits out this W, okay, becomes a down quark. And so now what we have, we have an up, down, and down. That's nothing but our friend the neutron. Okay? So if you're looking at this from a particle physics point of view, this is what that reaction is. But again, you're explaining the force in terms of basically particle mediation. Here. In other words, two particles. Think of this as a skateboarder, skateboarder. You're tossing this particle back and forth, and they're. Well, this one's a little odd because this would be your skateboarders would be changing. I, I don't know what that would be. So in other words, imagine this person that has some toxic virus that mutates your body. Okay. So this one tosses it over here. This mutates it into a neutrino, and in the process mutates into that. Okay, that's a really bad explanation, but it's. Okay. <coughs> So if you put all those pieces together, that's really your standard model. Okay. So let's put all the pieces together. So in the standard model for particle physics, we have three forces. The electromagnetic interaction, we have the strong interaction, and we have the weak interaction. Which one do we not have? Gravity. Okay. In the standard model, there's no gravity. No one knows quite how, 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 to, how to put that in. So we have these three forces, and the way that those forces interact is basically there's either photons, so the ele electromagnetic, gluons for the strong, and Ws and Zs for the weak. Don't worry about these Zs. These Zs are um, th they're somewhat odd. Don't, don't worry about this. Uh, it turns out that further you get six types of, of quarks. And again, you can't say types of quarks because that would be clear. And so you call them flavors. Again, all the names are dumb. Okay? So you say you have six flavors of quark. And anything that is made with a quark is called a hadron. So when you say the Large Hadron Collider, what this means is that it's going to actually be accelerating something made up of quarks, and it's going to be protons. Okay. So that's what a hadron is. And it turns out that one commonly, uh, there's kind of two common quark objects that exist. We've already seen one as our proton with three quarks. And anything with three quarks is called a baryon. So there's some of the jargon. The other thing we have is that we have three electron-like objects in a neutrino. So we have an electron. And we have a neutrino. We saw that. Well, it turns out that nature really likes that electron a lot. And it actually makes a really, really heavy copy of it. A heavy electron you call a muon. And it turns out that it has its corresponding neutrino. It turns out nature likes that so much it even makes a heavier copy of an electron. And you call that a tau. And it has its corresponding neutrino, too. So this really is makes up the, the standard model. Okay? It's absolutely remarkable. Okay? Now, there's only one tiny problem with this theory here. Okay? It's just a tiny little problem. The problem is, is you, if anything has mass, the whole thing falls apart and it's completely garbage. Okay. <laughs> now, sometimes people get fussy with scientists and stuff, and they say, "Well, your your theory should really explain life. You know, like it should agree with experiments and stuff like that." Okay. Well, we don't listen to those people. No. Okay. Well, <coughs> well, this is a problem. Okay. So it's it's really great that you have a theory that explains everything, except mass, which is the most fundamental property of anything. Okay. Uh, so, but the problem is, is when you do some of these calculations, it really appears to be correct. So you really have a conundrum is, 
that prescription of changing the sign everywhere and then saying the equations has to be correct has to have some level of truth in it because otherwise you won't be getting a lot of the success that you do. So again, let's go over our approach again. What was it? It's this little green thing, the, or uh, yellow thing, okay? Uh, we basically say that we're gonna have a wave function that describes anything. We're gonna make the sign change at different spots on the wave function. We're gonna then say that the equations, whatever they are, can't change. And if you do that, you get something really cool, okay? And so this would either be the, uh, the uh, theory of electricity magnetism, the theory of quartz, the weak interactions, that's whatever it is. Okay. Problem is in the center part. Okay. This is where things fall apart. Okay. And so the problem is, is okay. <coughs> if it has mass, this part here falls apart. Okay. So this has been known for some time and no one really had any idea really how to, how to take care of it. And this is basically what uh, Peter Higgs' uh, clever solution is. And I think there's probably a good chance of him getting probably the Nobel Prize for it this year. You can't get the Nobel Prize uh, if you're dead. And no offense to Peter Higgs, he looked pretty ancient. And so I think he's probably gonna be getting it uh, probably, I'd say he better get it soon, okay? <coughs> okay? okay. In grad school, I actually had the, I actually, was able to see Hans Bethe, who, was, who uh, when he was alive, was this very well-known physicist at you know, Cornell. And he was quite up there in age, and somebody says, well, is he coming again? I went, I think you wanna go now. You better, you better go see his talk today. Okay. <laughs> it turned out I was wrong. He actually lived for quite, quite some time. Uh, so this is what um, uh, Higgs did. He says, well, the particles aren't gonna have any mass. We're gonna say no mass, fine, okay? But I'm gonna introduce a new particle. It's gonna be called the Higgs. Okay, he didn't call it the Higgs. Know. Particle physicists are arrogant, but usually not that arrogant. Or, or, okay, they're at least not that obviously arrogant. Okay. Uh, I think one of the worst cases, basically there was a particle that people were looking for uh, called the J-Psi. It's when people were trying to find the, uh, the charm quark and it's connected with the, the charm quark. And there was two competing experiments. And there was one experiment, they couldn't figure out why that there was water, uh, some sort of fluid on the bottom of this every, every day. So they'd come back and there's basically this fluid every time on the experiment of where the apparatus was. So they set up a camera to find out what was leaking. Well, it turned out the competitor was basically coming up by at night and urinating on the experiment every night. <laughs> uh, so they're bad, but usually not this bad. Okay. 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 So uh, the Higgs works basically with their, with their usual approach. Okay. So we still assume nothing has any mass. Okay. <coughs> We're gonna assume that basically our wave function here, we can vary it anywhere, the equations remain the same, and then we're gonna predict cool stuff. So the, this is still our usual approach, okay? Now this is how, how, how it, it works, and this is, uh, there's really no good way to explain this, as you might realize. So he's gonna, he basically says that the Higgs particle is gonna interact with anything. So the Higgs particle is gonna interact with these electrons, which are massless. It's gonna interact with these gluons, which are massless. Anything out there that potentially has mass, this is gonna interact with. And so this is gonna be the, this axis here is the interaction energy. And then down here, he basically puts the strength of whatever that Higgs particle is. And I'm gonna put the strength and the value of the Higgs in quotes, okay? It has this really, really funny shape here. It's nice and symmetric. Now that symmetry is really the key to the problem, okay? It turns out that if you have this nice symmetric potential and you do that prescription that we had over here, if you do this prescription, Everything works fine, okay? Everything is, 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 is perfect. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so all, all those, that, the, the idea of changing the side at any point all works perfectly fine, okay? Now, here is a clever part that he realized. <coughs> Nature always tries to find like a minimum energy. So even though this thing is initially symmetric, eventually what, what this Higgs particle is gonna have to do, it's gonna have to figure out where it wants to go. Does it really want to go here or does it want to go here? Okay, it's going to actually have to assume, it has to assume some minimum value. Okay, that's probably Peter himself right now calling. Okay, <coughs> so let's say it takes this part right here. Okay, so let's say the Higgs selects this minimum. It turns out that when that Higgs particle selects this minimum, that actually gives particles to the mass. Uh, the mass, of the mass of the particles there. So it's actually it's the select is taking this potential, and nature of this Higgs particle actually having to pick a minimum either this minimum or that minimum. The actual potential actually looks more like a wine bottle. It's often called the wine bottle potential. 
So how does a wine bottle look? You know, it comes down here and it has that little concave thing here and it's round like that in the bottom. So this is round here. It actually has to pick some value there. Okay? It's actually in that picking process that actually mass is generated. And so uh, the way this inter works is the way that's typically explained is uh, imagine you have like a string. If you had a string, I could go like this through air really easy. But now if I try to do that through molasses, it, the string would get caught on the molasses. And so the way you can view this is basically these par massless particles are always interacting with this Higgs, but it's almost like a viscous drag on these uh, on, on the particles moving through there, and that's actually what's causing the mass. Okay, so is they actually able, able to save this the, the the system? Okay, so he made that prediction quite a while ago, and then the question is, um, the theory doesn't tell you how massive that particle has to be, and this is where the LHC. So now we get to go back to that first slide. So if you remember, I showed you the picture on France, and then there was that one line. I said you couldn't see it. There was that really really big line here. This is the LHC. So the way this works is you start over here, you take protons, and you basically send them through this little accelerator here, and you kind of ramp them up at speed, like this. And you send it up here, then you send it through this accelerator, you ramp up at speed. And then you can send it into this one here, and you basically can get it up to very close to the speed of light. Okay. Now what you do, you're going to then take the antimatter version of a proton, called an antiproton. I'll explain what that means. I can't wait to find out what it means. Take good notes. I hope it's interesting. Okay. That's the standard joke I always use with my students. They don't laugh when I say it's the first time either. So that's not my answer. <laughs> Usual look, look I get is, oh, so we're paying for this. Okay. But then I disconnect my finger like that. Because okay. <coughs> uh, clearly only somebody with talent could do that. So well then what you're going to do is basically <laughs> then take antiprotons, and I'll ex explain what they are. You're going to do the same thing with antiprotons. Uh, rev them up to speed here, rev them up to speed here, and then they can actually come out, this little guy here, and then go this way. So now you're going to get two counter-rotating beams. You're going to get protons going this way and antiprotons going that way. When they get up to speed, you're going to start intersecting the beams. And there's a couple spots. You can either intersect the beams here, you can intersect the beams here, you can intersect the beams here, you can intersect the beams here. These are all various detectors which are sensitive to different things. Uh, the Atlas is one of the big experiments. That's actually where the uh, uh, Higgs was actually discovered at the Atlas detector. And uh, this is actually how they found it. They basically ramped up uh, protons going this way, antiprotons going that way. You want all the energy to from the, the, the collision to basically go into new particles. That went into the new particle, and that's how they got the Higgs. It's, it turns out to be a fairly massive uh, particle. It's uh, about 125 times more massive than a proton. So I want to say a little bit about antimatter, okay? Because it's quite interesting. Okay, uh, this fellow was the one I told you the, is the enigma who uh, you know you don't hear a whole whole lot about, and he's the one who actually figured out how antimatter works. Um, absolutely, all of his arguments come out of left field. Uh, remarkable. So if I were to ask you what is the most famous equation in all of physics, you would say, well, E equals m c squared. Fine. Okay. The problem is, is actually Einstein's equation wasn't quite this. Einstein's equation looked more like this. Okay. It was really that this energy was squared, this MC squared itself is squared, and then plus, then there's a momentum term squared. Momentum just really refers to how fast the particle is going. Don't, don't, the actual thing doesn't matter. This is what matters. If a particle is at rest, there's no momentum. So let's take the case. This doesn't happen with chalk. Uh, Let's take the case where basically that term, the particle's at rest, and that term's equal to zero. Okay? So if this term's equal to zero, you get E squared equals MZ squared quantity squared, and you get this. You say, oh, if I take the square root, I'd just get back to here. Oh, that, that was a pointless exercise. Okay? It actually wasn't, because you really don't get that, do you? Really what you get is you get a plus or minus. Now, people knew about this for a long time, and the traditional way of doing it was basically to take that minus sign and just throw it out and say, well, it's just some, it's some extraneous root for math. Don't worry about it, blah, blah, blah. Get rid of it. Dirac, and this shows you just how clever he was, D Dirac didn't throw things away. Uh, Dirac actually came up with an equation to try to bypass this. It turned out he couldn't, and then he, being clever, figured out what to do with it. So let's make a graph of this. So I'm going to plot energy this way. Here's my e equals mc, uh, my e plus or minus mc squared. Now, what do these values look like? Okay. Well, this dotted line here, I'm going to call my e equals zero line. Fine. Okay. 
and my E equals MC squared line, I'm going to call this line here. Okay. So basically, if anything were moving, if it had momentum, or, uh, or had any type of velocity, I would have some value above here. So value, anything above here like this, this would be something with, that's actually not at rest. So this would be, a lot, this would be the energy of something at rest. Anything up here would, have, would be moving. Okay. Well, then this would be even the minus mc squared here. And uh, there's a problem here. The reason why people neglected this is let's say I had a particle here. Okay. So let's say I had a particle here. Well, systems try to go for a smallest energy. So if you had a particle here, what would happen? I'd basically drop down here, and it'd keep on falling down to all these other energy. There's a whole bunch of states down here. So it'd go up here, and it'd keep on falling down, 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 and that'd be it. It's basically saying that matter isn't stable. Okay. So people didn't really know what to do down here. Now, Dirac being clever did. Dirac said, well, my theory is right. This picture has to be correct. A particle up here can't fall down here. And if I can't, how can I prevent it? I know. I'll imagine that basically all, any type of particle that could be here is already filled. So these states that this could fall into, it can't because it's already occupied. And so what he's saying is that basically... If you have nothing, you really have a whole bunch of these negative energy uh, particles here. And you're going to say, well, you don't see this in life. And you don't. So you're going to say, well, this is a vacuum. So when you say a vacuum in physics, you're really referring to this here. The vacuum is probably one of the most complicated things in all of physics. It's still not understood at all. Okay, it's, uh, it's actually quite complicated. So Dirac is going to say this is all filled here. So let's just look at a little particle here. So let's look at a little tiny electron in one of these states here that, according to Dirac, should exist. And what would happen if a little piece of light here comes? So here's your little photon, and your little photon is going to hit that little, little negative energy particle there. What's going to happen? Okay. That took me a while to be able to do that. Okay. <coughs> let's go back and do it again. It's so cool. Okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. okay. I'm going to go up for probably, you know, I have up, I have to go up for a five-year review next year, so I needed something to put on my CV and stuff. So, this is uh, so the particle goes up here, it's up here. Now, what did we left, what are we left with? We're left with a hole here. Okay. Oh, okay, so this is basically matter up here. Okay. But we're left with a hole down here. And Dirac interpreted this hole as antimatter. Okay. So what this is going to be is going to be an antiparticle. So if this were a proton, this would then be an antiproton. You can see why they would annihilate if these were to get back and uh, if this were to come over here, they would completely annihilate each other in a, a burst of energy. If it took actually a photon to basically raise this up, if this falls back down here, it's also going to give off energy in the reverse process. So that's how you get antimatter. And so as they had in the news, basically these are the people who did the experiment. Uh, they're all celebrating. Uh, there's evidently a lot of beer, but there's a lot of them. Okay. <coughs> uh, so, okay, so this is the whole uh, uh, group. I could say, well, this is all fine, but, you know, it would be really nice if uh, somehow Alfred were connected with this. And it actually turns out there is a, a very odd Alfred connection, which I didn't realize uh, either. It's a very nice one. Okay. Here's a partial list of the people on the paper. Uh, on the paper, uh, the paper uh, I tried to get the entire paper, but since it's not published, I can only get a little bit of, of, uh, uh, a little bit of it. So when this is published, this will go on a lot more than this. It'll be just, I, could, I could keep on hitting that return button to show you all the pictures. But there's one name we're going to look at here. There. Who's that? The serial son. Okay. So there's an Alfred connection here. Okay. So uh, Ben is uh, actually he worked with Robert Holtzapel when he was uh, here as uh, 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 during the summer. Uh, I think he went to uh, Colgate, and now he's at Duke getting his PhD. But he actually worked on this project. Okay. So there's actually kind of a neat connection there. So the question is, what's next for the Higgs? Okay. So that interact, you know how he showed you that kind of like wine bottle potential that went down like this and it had that shape like that. He assumed he assumed the simplest thing possible. Okay. Now the question is, is this correct? And so what probably won't make the press because it's not that exciting as finding the Higgs is we're going to first of all find out what kind of particle it is. In other words, what is that interaction? Um, there's an odd prediction from Higgs model. It basically says that. Uh, the more massive a particle is, the more the Higgs interacts with it. So an uh, Higgs would interact really strongly with an electron, but it interacts really, really strongly with basically a muon, which is 270 times heavier. Okay. 
So that's prediction. Whether that's true or not, who knows? Okay. So I think this will, this is what's going to be next for Higgs. But now there's a, a fundamental problem with the standard model. There's multiple problems with them. Okay. <coughs> One is first of all, it doesn't predict what any of these masses are going to be. There's a it makes a couple of predictions for masses, but it doesn't tell you what the mass of an electron is. It doesn't tell you what the mass of any of the quarks are. If you had a truly fundamental theory, a fundamental theory it should tell you in principle what all the masses are. The other thing is it doesn't tell you whether there's three types of electrons or, or six types of quarks. Uh, you would think that if you had a fundamental theory that that would actually tell you why there's only, you know, an electron, a really heavy electron, and an even heavier electron. Okay? It doesn't. Okay, that seems odd. And also, if you look at the whole theory itself, there's, uh, I think there's something on the order of like 30 undefined parameters. Uh, there's various things you have to put in. Uh, they're kind of abstract for this talk, so I, I didn't mention any, any of them here. But th 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 some of these include like, things like the masses. So you have to put in a whole bunch of un undetermined uh, properties. And the other thing is gravity. Okay? Gravity is not in this theory at all. Okay? And so these are fundamental problems with the theory. Now this is actually kind of an interesting philosophical point. Is even the proponents of this theory will be, will be the first to state that uh, this is amazing, but it's probably not true because of these problems here. Okay. Now, what do you do when you have a theory which works absolutely perfectly? Anything you, you, you predict with this theory is exact. It, it agrees exactly with the theory. But you know it's fundamentally wrong. Okay. And that's kind of interesting. Okay. Uh, probably what the standard model is, there's going to be some theory that's probably correct, whatever that is. <coughs> if you look at a low energy reduction of that correct theory, it pro it's going to probably reduce to the standard model. So probably what we're looking at is basically a low-end version of a low-end energy version of the theory. It's a little bit like uh, Newton's law of gravitation. What does Newton's law of gravitation state? It states if you have a mass here and a mass here, that that the gravitational force goes as one over r squared. Okay? Is that right? No. And even Newton knew it was wrong. Uh, basically, Newton realized there was no time dependence on Newton. There had to be. Well, what's the, the what's the more correct theory? Well, it'd be Einstein's theory. And if you take Einstein's theory into the appropriate limit. It reduces to basically Newton's law of gravitation. I think this is what this is going to be: is that whatever the exact theory is, if you look at a low energy limit of it, it's, uh, it's going to reduce to the standard model. Okay. Now, one of the problems is is that actually you want to start poking holes in this, and no one knows where the holes are going to occur and at what energies. And so people might be stuck with the standard model for some time. I think probably in the future what they're going to have to do, and I think it's the only way out of it is that you need ridiculously high energies to probably start poking holes in this, potentially. And the only way you can really do this is not on Earth, is actually with cosmic rays. So I think probably the future of, of, of particle physics, what it's going to be, will be space-based detectors that will be in space, looking for a cosmic ray to come through, and then actually looking at what comes off from that. Okay, and I think that's where things have to go. And how am I doing on time? Okay. I told you there was a natural spot. See, I have more. Oh, oh, okay. The solutions need some material stop. Okay. Doesn't he already look ticked? He's probably happy then. Okay, so yes, okay. <coughs> if there's more time, I'd go. If I come back, I'll talk about supersymmetry. Any questions? We're, we're done.